All right, well, <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me um, back to Illinois. I was here for several years, and it's uh, always a pleasure to come back and visit. So uh, as I, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. Uh, I don't work on plants, uh, at least I have. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to tell you about computational tools. I think the genesis of this is that Steve Long and I used to talk a lot about trying to build models of plants. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, this will be uh, talking a little bit about some of the uh, tools and such that we have done in humans and in microbes and in a lot of other systems that might be relevant to uh, the discussion that we're having here. So of course, there's lots of complexity as we think about reconstructing plants all the way from uh, the DNA structure, which in plants can be, of course, extremely complicated and um, lots of um, multiploidy uh, beyond probably uh, what we see in any of the other domains of life. Uh, and so there's a ton of complexity here to work out in terms of wanting to do plants in silico. So I do a lot of work in network modeling. Uh, network models, of course, are one really powerful way to have structured hypotheses. Uh, basically, just the notion that we can't write, you know, we can't say in one sentence our hypothesis for how a cell functions, but we can write a lot of those hypotheses down as network models. So they are falsifiable, generally not in, in holes, but in parts. And so this drives an iterative process of experimentation and model building. There are many, of course, different types of models that one could think about uh, at the cellular network level, uh, signaling metabolic gene regulatory. I'm only going to talk about two of them today, uh, metabolic and gene regulatory. And in terms of dealing with uh, these kinds of approaches, Really, the number one thing I think that you have to deal with in, as a modeler is to deal with uncertainty, right? And so basically, as you think about uh, modeling approaches, we know vastly less uh, than we really need to, uh, especially if we try to build these out with any sort of mechanistic detail. And so uh, the ability uh, to think about model schemes that work well uh, with uncertainty and in the context of what we don't have uh, available is essential uh, to really make these possible. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of uh, general areas uh, that we've done quite a lot of work uh, in, as have a number of others who are here in the audience. Uh, so first, I'll talk just a little bit about the tools of metabolic network analysis. So um, metabolic networks uh, turn sequences into uh, functional networks. Uh, see, it's a little uh, overrun there. Uh, but basically, uh, the notion is we can start from a genome annotation. Uh, from those, uh, by ortholog matching and so forth, you can come up with reaction pathways, and you can end up with uh, what's called a genome scale metabolic reconstruction. So essentially, this is to try to represent as much as we know about the biochemistry that's in a particular organism. Uh, and as we talked about in one of our breakout groups, there's uh, an important uh, distinction between the concept of a reconstruction and the concept of a model. And the concept of a reconstruction is basically to try to reconstruct as much about the biochemistry that's happening in the cell or the organism that you know, uh, a little bit agnostic as to whether or not it fits within the context of a model. So it's a repository of knowledge. On top of that, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, you can then build simplified, uh, or more streamlined models where essentially you're adding the mathematics and computation on top of the reconstruction. So that will be uh, an important concept. As you start building out these um, reconstructions for a plant or any other organism, what invariably happens, and this happens even in E. coli, which is uh, probably the best uh, understood uh, organism uh, that we have, uh, in essence, when you build all that we know about metabolism together and you try to simulate uh, its ability to grow, there are always gaps in the network. And these gaps become, uh, are part of that uncertainty I was referring to before, and these become really uh, important for us to fill in in the best way possible. Uh, so one tool that we have developed, and this was developed uh, actually by Matt Benedict uh, during his time uh, in my lab here uh, back uh, when I was at the University of Illinois, um, and so, in essence, though, what this is, this is a maximum likelihood gap filling. And so what this will do is if we know, based on physiology, for example, that this metabolic network must make some product. Obvious example of this, you see alanine in the protein, and yet your metabolic network doesn't explain how to make alanine. You know for a fact that the organism makes it because it's not eating it, and it's sitting there in the protein. 
And so you end up with a number of these questions. All right, how do I actually make this gap? So most of the models, uh, uh, gap filling that's done uh, at present is done using parsimony, which is a principle in modeling I generally agree with. But in essence, this is uh, just filling in the shortest number of reactions that it will take to make something functional. What we've done instead with maximum likelihood gap filling is we will postulate with an algorithm a whole host of different possible connections. And then using evidence from the genome, for example, uh, we dive in, and you can also use metabolomics if it's available, we get an evidence score. So you may have uh, a longer pathway that fills in, but you end up with stronger evidence scores, and in fact, that's what would fill in. So this is just a way to try to make uh, the models uh, Come, or I'm sorry, the reconstructions capable of sustaining a model uh, on top of them, but filling in with as much evidence as possible. Okay. So when we try to move, <coughs> excuse me. So when we try to move from a reconstruction to a model, in essence, what we're doing is just taking that reconstruction, which in a metabolic network uh, simply is a stoichiometric matrix uh, where all of the rows are reactions, uh, I'm sorry, all of the columns are reactions, all of the rows are the different uh, metabolites uh, that are operating there. So you just have this matrix. And so once you have it in that form that just represents the biochemistry, you can now apply the tools of linear algebra, linear optimization, convex analysis, and so forth, essentially just layering mathematics on top of that network. And this allows you to do computable models. And as I was mentioning about uncertainty uh, in the introduction, uh, one of the nice approaches of this, uh, what's called a constraint-based modeling approach, is that you don't try to solve for the solution of the cell because you don't have enough information to do that. Rather, you solve for a solution space, which are all the range of possible states of this network that do not violate either mass balance, uh, that don't violate energetic constraints uh, to the extent you can represent them. And Dan Beard here in the audience has really uh, pushed this as far as anybody. And then you have also uh, are in as much agreement with the measured experimental data as you have as possible, and anything else is left free. Now within that, then, you have these solution spaces, and there's a whole host of different methods that you can apply. You can optimize within a space to solve for what's the optimum growth rate. You can say what's the optimum rate of um, ATP production, what's the, op op uh, what's the optimal CO2 conversion rate in photosynthesis, on and on and on. So you can ask a whole series of questions once you have these uh, networks in place. Okay, so in essence then, uh, the models, you have your growth medium, so what's coming in. Uh, you have your internal metabolism, and you're predicting things like secreted products, uh, like the formation of biomass, and these can all be contextualized to different environments. And you can simulate in advance uh, also the outcomes of genetic manipulations. So once these are accurate, uh, they are quite uh, useful. So in terms of uh, looking at uh, manual uh, reconstructions or building one of these at scale, even for a microbe, this is still a fairly long process, uh, but it is getting better by uh, combining automated and manual reconstruction tools. We're building a number of these. Uh, there have been a number built. Uh, within the context of uh, the DOE uh, knowledge base or K-base, um, uh, which has its, um, its pros and cons in terms of how that's uh, coming together. Uh, but there are some no uh, really nice work from Chris Henry uh, and others on uh, automating uh, a lot of this process. Uh, but in, in general, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, and this is something that we have a number of tools uh, to try to uh, advance and make better. Uh, models uh, predict reaction fluxes, they're called. Really, uh, these are steady state reaction rates. Uh, and so these give you an ability to monitor, uh, to estimate uh, ranges of usages or rates of, of, of what are called fluxes uh, in this space uh, through these networks. And so these are the kind of things that we could do uh, in plants as well uh, so that you can simulate uh, what is actually being used. And there are a number of approaches uh, from us and others where you can layer on uh, data such as gene expression data, and you can bias your solutions such that you find uh, flux distributions which are congruent with what's passing the boundaries of 
of, of the cell or the organism in terms of what's getting eaten, what's getting secreted, how much biomass is being made. And then you can also layer on gene expression and then bias your solution such that it matches as well as possible the enzymes that are being uh, created and so forth. Uh, gene expression is used most uh, of the time for those kind of things just because it's readily available. Obviously, proteomics data is even better uh, when you've got it. So in terms of accuracies, uh, this is just giving uh, a sense for uh, some of the kinds of predictions that come out of this. This is a study that um, was done by Ben Hebner uh, in my group that we published uh, last year in uh, PLOS Computational Biology. And in essence, what this was was a review of all of the, uh, all of the uh, models that had been created uh, for yeast over about the past decade. And then it shows accuracies on a whole host of different uh, validation data sets. And then you can see, um, and I shouldn't say accuracies exactly. This is using something that is called the Matthews correlation coefficient. Uh, for those who are familiar with it. If you're not, this is a very commonly used uh, metric, uh, particularly in machine learning and uh, statistical modeling and such, where uh, you are looking at your ability to make binary classifications. In this case, this predicts whether or not an enzyme knockout will be lethal or not to uh, yeast under a host of different environmental conditions. You use something like Matthews correlation coefficient because accuracy can be misleading. Uh, in some of our models where we do, for example, knockouts of transcription factors and their effects on growth, uh, if your default assumption is that if you knock out a transcription factor, you're going to survive, like that's a 90% good model. But if you just put that in, that would give you a zero on Matthews correlation coefficient because Matthews correlation coefficient takes into account that there's an imbalance in the predictions you're making. And so it's a more accurate measure of the, of the amount of information that's done. Uh, that's in your predictor rather than just the number you got right, which sometimes you can get a high number with uh, something that's trivial that doesn't actually contain information. Anyway, the take home of this is that we see uh, Matthews correlation coefficients overall. Uh, the latest models have gotten up to be about 0.7, uh, which is actually quite uh, strong and good. And there is, in general, an overall uh, trend uh, that's in the upward direction, not monolithically so. Uh, and it also demonstrates uh, across the field uh, something not surprising but important, which is that there is a degree of overfitting to data that, uh, that has already been seen. So when the models are created, there is a bias, even though it's um, a little more implicit as people are building the, the models, they tend to do better on the data that came before than the data that, come, that came after. And so we have now a quantification of that. That'll be an issue, of course, in building models for the plants as well. Uh, as uh, new data comes forward. So I was also part of the international consortium that built uh, the latest reconstruction for uh, human metabolic network. Uh, this contains about 2,500 different chemical reactions in humans. I bring this one up because it's probably the most relevant to something at the scale of what's being discussed here of plants in silica where you have lots of different cell types, lots of different tissues, uh, and there is a lot, uh, a lot going on. This is a model that is likely to be um, and I'm using model here in different ways. This is a, uh, an example uh, of something that might be relevant uh, for plants in silico as well. Uh, these, as well as some other organisms, have been uh, reconstructed around uh, jamborees. Uh, Bernard Paulson's been a really big uh, advocate and leader for a number of those uh, jamborees, as have a few other people. Uh, those jamborees are very useful because you bring together all the people who are really expert at the, say, biochemistry, metabolism of the organism. You get them in the same room for some days with uh, people who are doing modeling, and that can often be a good way to push forward and drive these reconstructions uh, forward. Uh, my lab, as well as others, have uh, built algorithms where you can then take this global reconstruction that comes from the... Uh, analysis at the genome and whole organism level, and then you can contextualize which aspects of metabolism are most prevalently expressed in different tissues or cell types. Uh, so if you had your model from the whole plant genome, for example, with metabolism, you can then come in and look at uh, different cell types based on expression of either proteins and or genes, uh, contextualize down the part of metabolism that seems to be operational, and with the additional constraint that, that the model must still be functional. So you can feed it both the functional interconversions that that cell type must achieve in order to survive and carry out its functions, coupled with the omics data, because there'll be gaps as well. 
Okay, anyway, so that's just a little bit about metabolic networks. So I'll talk uh, now just very briefly about uh, some of the work that we've done in transcriptional regulatory networks, which uh, also I think can translate. And this was work done uh, primarily by Seth Ahmed and also by uh, Corey Funk and my group, um, both uh, Illinois graduates. So uh, genes involve influence behavior uh, through a network of networks, right? DNA to the uh, molecular networks. Uh, in this case, we're looking at brains, so neur neural networks, brain connectivity, individual, social networks. Uh, same kind of thing in plants, right? There's a whole hierarchy of multi-scale analysis that we care about. And so uh, at the cell level, what we've been looking at uh, in some detail is just reconstructing transcriptional regulatory networks in humans. Uh, so here, uh, just identifying transcription factor binding sites. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and using a large amount of gene expression data to build models. And of course, a lot of people are working on these kind of things. Uh, our latest iteration of that is something we call TRINA, which stands for Transcriptional Regulatory Network Analysis, so fairly generic, but we like the uh, acronym. So uh, TRINA is a pipeline. I won't go through it in detail, but it takes into, into account a lot of data that are coming from very large-scale NIH projects like ENCODE, uh, which is mapping out all the regulatory regions in the human genome. Uh, it leverages uh, a GTEx, which is doing genotype to tissue expression, again, across all tissues in the human. Uh, and in essence, what it leverages a lot is something called DNA footprinting, uh, which gives you candidate sites for transcription factor binding sites. We then do motif discovery to match which transcription factors are likely to bind to those regions. We do scanning across the genome so that you can identify which genes are likely to be regulated by those parts. And in essence, all of that gives you a big candidate network of putative transcriptional regulatory networks and putative targets. And then we feed in, um, in general, thousands of RNA-seq experiments through this. We do machine learning to try to figure out which of those appear to be functional. Uh, we end up then with a large-scale network. And uh, I won't go through it in too much detail, but one of the really fascinating things is that we, we do a lot of this work in conjunction with the Accelerating Medicines uh, Program for Alzheimer's Disease, uh, which we have part of the center of, as well as our Big Data to Knowledge Center. And those groups, uh, and especially for AMP-AD, are very focused on trying to predict uh, intervention strategies. And so you end up with cases where you have evidence for uh, gene networks that are very highly differentially expressed, the transcription factors that are driving those, and also, you identify in the regulatory regions for those transcription factor SNPs that are differential between individuals that have Alzheimer's and who don't. So you end up with this very strong multifactorial uh, kinds of data that all comes and feeds together. And I think this is the similar kind of thing that could be done uh, in plants. There are certain elements of the data that I believe are not available in plants that are in humans, but there are also workarounds uh, for a number of these kind of things. But you can build these out uh, pretty beautifully now. Um, this varies across tissues. Uh, I won't go through the details of this. This is through the brain, but basically shows that once you get the footprints for the midbrain, uh, we get a lot of those, and as you go on, you just keep adding uh, a little bit more. Uh, in terms of accuracies here, uh, we can get at um, uh, quite good accuracies. I won't go through all of this. This utilizes also ChIP-seq. Uh, when it's available. This is in lymphoblasts, which has the most of this kind of data of any uh, tissue uh, uh, in any higher organism, as far as I know. And anyway, our, our area under the curve, we're able to uh, enhance very uh, significantly by putting this in. And so this is, and this is a first pass. We just did this in the last two weeks, so we think that this will actually even get better. Uh, but that's a 55% sensitivity, 70% uh, specificity in terms of inferring an extremely large um, network. Won't go through this. You end up with uh, looking at these for targets. So that ends up then with this huge uh, network uh, that's put together. Obviously, for plants, would be similar. And the brain, uh, also like uh, with plants, uh, is interesting in the sense, this is an analysis I don't have time to go in. Uh, we published this in PNAS a few years ago. But this uh, essentially showed that ex gene expression in the brain was sufficiently um, spatially controlled to where you could, by only doing an analysis of gene, of neuron-specific genes in the brain, you can 
run clustering algorithms, essentially, and recapitulate uh, most all of the uh, anatomical features of the brain by just doing cluster analysis of spatial gene expression. Uh, it's a very cool study. It leverages a $100 million investment from Paul Allen and his uh, institute. Thank you, Paul. And so he um, uh, really did a lot of great uh, work. But this analysis, in essence, uh, shows us that what I expect is likely to be true, at least to some degree, as well in plants, which is that uh, gene expression networks and such will likely be spatially um, different. So we can take these kind of models and build them together, transcriptional regulatory networks and metabolic networks. Uh, this involves integrating different kinds of network modeling approaches as well, statistical as well as mechanistic, and that's a general uh, problem and difficulty in systems biology. Uh, we have done some work in this space. Uh, Shriram Chandrasekharan, another uh, uh, Illinois grad uh, who's uh, currently a Harvard Junior Fellow, uh, just about to start his uh, faculty job probably at Michigan. Um, but he did a, a, an approach called PROM, uh, which is one of the initial ways that we've had to integrate metabolic and transcriptional regulatory networks together. We have the next iteration of that, which we call iDream, uh, which is a data-driven regulation, integration of data-driven regulation and metabolism. This is under review currently at uh, Cell Systems, uh, but this will be the first approach that in integrates an inferred regulatory network where you can pull a lot of this from high throughput data coupled with a mechanistic network um, and metabolism. And then this is just uh, conceptual. This is pulled from uh, a center grant proposal I put in NIH uh, a few years ago. Uh, but this was a proposal for something that we call the IMON framework for integrated multiomic networks. And the idea here is that you can, uh, at least this is you know, theoretical, but you have this core of a mechanistic uh, uh, center, in this case centered a lot around metabolism where we can write down a lot of the biochemistry. This metabolic regulatory network modeling can be around that to regulatory to causal. And the idea is just that you have sort of a core that's as close to the biochemistry as possible. And what we showed, although I didn't have time to put it in here, and we had another paper uh, on a method called Gemini, is that you can actually enhance statistical inference when you're doing it on top of biochemistry in some really interesting ways. And I think that there's a lot of potential for leveraging on that kind of thing in the context of plants and silico. With that, let me thank uh, all the people uh, who were involved in this work. And I think I basically thanked them as we uh, went along. And I'll end in the interest of time. Thanks.